Good morning. Uh, we are still uh, welcoming people uh, and waiting for them to connect, but I think it is time for us to start since it's already uh, uh, 10.01. Um, so good morning. Welcome to this webinar dedicated to heat planning and how they can be used in decarbonizing our regions and our cities. Um, my name is Clémence Priquen. I am project officer at FEDEREN. It's the European Federation of Agencies and Regions for Energy and Environment. I am particularly happy uh, to be uh, hosting this session today. Uh, we have a very nice uh, panel, um, and uh, I, I guess you saw it in the agenda already, but I will uh, present them very quickly later on. Uh, but before we start, um... hi, Timmy. <laughs> Can you mute yourself, please? <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Um, yeah, oops. But some housekeeping rules uh, also so that everyone is on the same page. Um, just like quickly mentioned, um, if you could keep your microphone muted to yeah. avoid any disturbances with the speakers, uh, it would be uh, very much appreciated. For your cameras, um, for the flow and the, and the, um, uh, the internet uh, uh, and Wi-Fi connection, if you can keep them off during the presentations, but then turn them on at the Q&A, it would be also um, the best. Um, if you have questions for the speakers, I kindly ask you to put them in the chat box. Um, I don't remember exactly where it is, but it should be easy to find. Um, I will be asking the first questions, and then if you need some specific uh, um, Precisions, uh, you can then unmute yourself and have the proper follow up questions if it's really necessary. Um, and then finally, before I forget, uh, also uh, the, the webinar will be recorded. We will make it available um, publicly as well. You will have a follow up email at the end of the, uh, probably a couple of days after this webinar with both the links to the presentations that will be uh, given today and the recording as well. I hope these uh, housekeeping rules are uh, clear to everyone. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't worry if you need to leave earlier, um, you will have the, the material as well. Um, I will give a very quick overview of the speakers we have. They are in order of their presentation for the, for the agenda that you could see in the agenda. Our first speaker is uh, Ms. Claudia Canivari. She is the head of unit for energy efficiency at DGNR at the European Commission. Um, she will give an insight of uh, what the new um, energy efficiency directive that has been adopted very uh, early a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, will uh, change for the cities and in terms of, of course, uh, heat plants, but uh, I guess she will give a slightly more um, insight on it. And then we will follow with three uh, projects that are all working on planning to some extent. The first one is uh, Decarb City Pipe 2050 uh, with our uh, speaker, uh, Astrid uh, uh, Madsen, sorry. Um, Astrid is uh, self-employed at her own company, uh, which is uh, Astrid Madsen Bodenel um, and has a, a very long standing uh, experience. <laughs> Also, following up on that, we will have uh, Mr. Tomislav uh, um, Novosel, sorry, uh, who's working at uh, Regea. It's an energy agency uh, that is situated in the northwest region of uh, Croatia, and he will present the in-plan project. And then finally, we have uh, Dominique van der Wille, um, who will uh, present the Connect Heat project, and uh, he's working at the Intercommunal uh, Leyendal. Um, my, I, I would like, I'm checking with my colleague if uh, our first speaker has arrived, because unfortunately she's quite um, uh, tight in her schedule, so she will have to leave immediately after, um, but I don't know if she's arrived already. Um, is uh, Claudia Canavari have arrived? Have you seen her? Uh, she's in. All right, great. Um, Ms. Canavari, if you could uh, unmute yourself, otherwise I will ask. Yes. 
wonderful. Can okay. You hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Very good. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Prickain, and uh, uh, good morning to you and to uh, uh, everyone uh, uh, online. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to be uh, uh, here uh, today. Um, and uh, um, I would like uh, to uh, talk uh, uh, about uh, um, uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive, the newly adopted uh, uh, recast uh, directive, uh, and how this uh, is relevant for uh, heating and cooling, uh, uh, with also um, uh, a few elements uh, of uh, uh, the uh, new re Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, so, uh, as uh, as you uh, you all know, I, I assume uh, the energy efficiency directive was adopted uh, on uh, the thirteenth of uh, September. It was published uh, in the official journal on the twentieth of September, and will enter into force in six days' time on the tenth of uh, October. Uh, and the member states will have then two years uh, to uh, transpose uh, uh, the directive. Uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive reviews uh, uh, the energy efficiency target for uh, 2030, uh, and uh, the uh, the target is now binding uh, for the EU, uh, and it is uh, set, uh, uh, as you probably know, at a new level. In the uh, 2018 uh, uh, version of the directive, the one that is in force uh, today, uh, the target was to reduce uh, uh, final energy consumption uh, at least uh, uh, of 32.5% uh, by 2030 compared The sound turned off. Sorry, yeah. Miss Kenna, very unfortunately, you are muted. Said. Sorry. No, I'm not. I... Well, uh, it, yeah, it was just a couple of seconds. Now you're back. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry, Hi. because I don't see, I don't see muted. So I don't know. Sorry for that. Where did no, you lose me? Actually, a, a couple of sentences ago. So we haven't lost a lot at all. A lot, I think. Okay, so maybe I'll just. Uh... Uh, just to recap, I was just saying that the 2018 directive has a target of 32.5% uh, based on the 2007 uh, scenario and that the new directive, the recast directive, uh, uh, has a higher target, which is 11.7% uh, compared to the 2020 reference uh, scenario. Uh, and this is broadly equivalent to 38% savings uh, compared to the 2007 uh, reference uh, scenario. And the new target uh, is uh, uh, complemented with a strong uh, governance mechanism and a gap filling mechanism to ensure that all the national contributions by the member states add up uh, to uh, the EU target. And beside the new energy efficiency uh, targets, the directive introduces an increased annual energy saving obligation uh, and the public sector uh, energy saving target, uh, which is uh, uh, entirely new, uh, along with the strengthening uh, and deepening of additional measures uh, for the energy intensive industries, uh, uh, measures to empower consumers, uh, and uh, uh, there is also quite a uh, relevant and strong focus uh, on uh, alleviating energy poverty, including uh, um, a new definition of uh, uh, energy poverty, which is the first definition ever in the EU acquis. Uh, and that will be used for other um, uh, areas. Uh, for example, it is already in use for the um, um, social and climate uh, uh, fund. Um, as uh, you all know, of course, uh, uh, in heating and cooling, uh, the decarbonization challenge uh, for the EU is uh, uh, still enormous. Uh, in fact, uh, um, the amount of uh, fossil energy uh, that still needs uh, to be uh, replaced in the energy system uh, is uh, a staggering uh, 300 to 400 uh, uh, MTOEs. And therefore, the uh, uh, ED recast uh, includes uh, uh, several measures uh, to stimulate the transition in the heating and cooling sector. It includes, uh, for example, the obligation on uh, planning uh, in the heating and, cool and cooling sector. And by defining uh, efficient uh, district heating and cooling uh, uh, network-based uh, uh, heating and cooling solutions, uh, uh, it is also uh, uh, including an important uh, element. Uh, and another uh, point that I would like to recall in this area is that within the energy saving obligation, which is in Article 8, uh, the present Article 7, the very famous Article 7, uh, member states uh, uh, may uh, set up measures uh, to tackle the use of uh, fossil fuels in local heating and cooling uh, solutions. 
the extent uh, uh, to which this uh, could be done is, of course, left uh, to the individual uh, member states. Um, in the recast uh, directive, uh, uh, there is a specific uh, focus uh, on uh, uh, district heating and cooling, uh, as, uh, as mentioned. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, as you are uh, uh, certainly aware, there are 17,000 district heating systems uh, uh, in the EU, which are serving uh, 60 million uh, people. But uh, uh, most of the heat supply in these uh, district heating uh, systems uh, is still coming from uh, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and of course, therefore, in order to make sure that we reach our uh, uh, energy and climate goals, uh, it is uh, uh, essential to uh, decarbonize uh, uh, the district heating uh, systems. Uh, uh, and, if, and it is essential also that the share of uh, renewable energy in these uh, uh, systems uh, uh, is uh, uh, increased. And uh, therefore, in order to make sure that uh, uh, results uh, are achieved uh, in uh, this area, uh, the definition of uh, uh, district heating uh, uh, and cooling uh, is revised uh, in the recast uh, uh, directive. It is quite a complex uh, uh, set of uh, numbers. So there are different uh, dates, uh, but uh, allow me to uh, recall uh, just the three uh, most essential uh, elements. So the first point uh, is that uh, systems uh, that are supplied uh, with fossil fuels uh, cannot meet the definition of uh, efficient uh, district heating and cooling uh, after uh, 2034. The second point uh, is that the share of uh, renewable energy must gradually increase in the systems uh, uh, to meet the definition. And after 2044, only renewable energy can be counted towards the definition. And this is changing again because as of 2050, all the heat supplied has to be renewable or waste heat. And the third point that I would like to mention amongst all these numbers and dates is that after 2045, the contribution of the high efficiency cogeneration from fossil fuels uh, is not counted uh, towards meeting the definition of uh, efficient district heating and cooling. As you see, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite complex. Uh, but uh, um, uh, in order to, let's say, uh, um, um, facilitate uh, um, uh, the approach for member states uh, towards uh, uh, the decarbonization of uh, uh, efficient district heating and cooling, uh, there is also in the recast uh, ED an alternative definition of uh, efficient distinct heating uh, and cooling. And this is based uh, on uh, specific uh, green gas emissions uh, of the uh, heat supply. Uh, and the threshold for this uh, is uh, uh, made uh, more tighten um, um, uh, as the time goes by. And as of 2050, uh, the district heating and cooling uh, systems uh, uh, meeting the definition should not generate any uh, GHG emission. And uh, until uh, the 31st of December 2025, the threshold is uh, uh, 200 grams per kilowatt hour. From the 1st of January 2026, uh, it is uh, 150 grams per kilowatt hour. And the next uh, stages are then foreseen for 2035 and 2045. Um, I don't think that uh, anybody will be criticized for not remembering all these figures by heart. So it is uh, 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 it is really uh, quite uh, quite something. But I hope that uh, I've given you an indication of uh, uh, what is uh, what is coming up in the next uh, uh, in the next years. Um, and uh, um, um, something also that I that I should have mentioned before this last comment is that uh, uh, on top of the definition of uh, uh, efficient district heating and cooling, uh, the directive is also allowing to have new fossil fuel based capacities in the he district heating and cooling systems only until 2030. So the hope is really that. Uh, there will be movement uh, towards uh, uh, phasing out fossil fuels uh, from this heating uh, 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 as soon uh, uh, as possible. Um, why it is important, uh, this definition of uh, um, uh, efficient uh, district heating and cooling? It is uh, uh, obviously uh, 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 not only linked to, uh, to decarbonization, but also to what uh, turns around uh, uh, the definition of uh, efficient district heating and cooling. In fact, uh, state aid or other kind of supports uh, cannot be provided until uh, the district heating and cooling system uh, uh, achieves uh, uh, the compliance with the definition, respects uh, all the numbers, uh, some of which I have mentioned. 
And then uh, the second is that uh, all the district heating systems above uh, five uh, megawatt should have a plan on how they are going to meet the definition of, of uh, efficient uh, district heating and cooling. And what is also important is that this plan uh, needs to be updated every uh, five years. I mentioned at the beginning that I would have just said a couple of words on the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, this is uh, also important because uh, um, as regards uh, heating and cooling, the two directives uh, uh, go uh, hand in hand. We've been working uh, very closely with our colleagues responsible for the uh, Renewable Energy Directive in order to ensure coherence and consistency and uh, the, the, this mutually reinforcing uh, approach. Um, you are uh, certainly aware that um, uh, the Parliament approved uh, uh, the review of the energy uh, renewables, uh, sorry, the Renewable Energy Directive uh, on the 12th of September, and the Council is deemed to approve it uh, uh, on the 9th of uh, uh, October. Uh, in uh, the Renewables Energy Directive, uh, there is a sub target for heating uh, and cooling, uh, where the share of, of uh, renewables should increase uh, year by year and uh, renewable in heating and cooling uh, shall increase uh, by an annual average of uh, 0.8 percentage points uh, for the period 2021 to 2025 and of at least 1.1 percentage percentage points uh, for the period 2026 uh, to 2030 if uh, waste he uh, heat uh, is included uh, the binding uh, annual target increases to 1% percent and 1.3 percent respectively for the two periods uh, uh, that I have uh, uh, mentioned. Um, going back still to um, uh, what is included uh, uh, in uh, the energy efficiency directive, I just would like to uh, recall uh, an important part of uh, uh, the district heating features uh, which is about uh, uh, the planning. Um, clearly, um, um, uh, heating and cooling uh, cannot, uh, I mean, be easily changed, or it, it requires uh, some uh, uh, long-term efforts uh, and uh, significant uh, resources. And this is why uh, the AED recast includes uh, uh, some uh, important uh, provisions, some important requirements as regards uh, uh, planning in the heating uh, and the cooling uh, uh, sector. Uh, the, the planning uh, requirements uh, that I mentioned already for the five uh, megawatt, uh, uh, for the above five megawatt uh, um, um, uh, systems, uh, this heating uh, uh, systems, uh, there are also two more uh, planning obligations. Uh, uh, that uh, one that is uh, um, that applies to the member states uh, and one that applies uh, on the local level, and this is on the local level is uh, I think particularly interesting. Uh, so, but starting from the national uh, level, what member states uh, need to do is that they need to identify the most uh, resource efficient uh, and cost efficient uh, solutions uh, to meet uh, uh, heating and cooling needs. And for this purpose, uh, a cost benefit analysis of the heat and cold uh, supply um, um, uh, possibilities, options uh, on the territory uh, need, uh, needs to be made. And this is the, the uh, comprehensive assessment, I think is, is known uh, as with, with this, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, expression, um, uh, maps uh, what the potential uh, heat uh, supply uh, from uh, cogeneration uh, and from the sources of uh, renewable energy and waste heat uh, uh, could be. And then the second step is that this information that is uh, uh, collected is uh, compared uh, with the heat uh, and cool and cold uh, demand uh, patterns uh, and based on the outcome then uh, uh, measures to increase uh, the efficiency and the use of uh, uh, renewable energy uh, in heating and cooling uh, uh, shall be identified and uh, uh, as you know uh, there are connections between uh, these comprehensive assessments uh, and the uh, national energy and climate plans because uh, uh, the measures for heating and cooling needs to be reflected uh, in the uh, NECPs. Um, just to recall, uh, uh, as you are uh, uh, in any case, even if you are in any case probably aware, the next uh, NECPs uh, uh, are due by uh, the end of June 2024, and there was a previous deadline by the end of June this year for the draft uh, uh, NECPs. Uh, but I was mentioning uh, that what was particularly interesting is this uh, new requirement uh, uh, for reporting at uh, uh, local level. 
uh, the ED recast uh, introduces a new provision that obliges uh, uh, municipalities uh, with more than uh, 45,000 inhabitants uh, to prepare uh, a local heating and cooling plan. And this is very interesting because it gives uh, the possibility to uh, more than uh, 1,000 municipalities uh, in the EU uh, to have uh, a roadmap to decarbonize their uh, heating and cooling uh, uh, systems. So it's a, it's a very good uh, uh, pattern. Um, as I said, there are quite a lot of requirements to make to to uh, to uh, plan, but the directive itself uh, does not uh, uh, specify uh, what these uh, plans uh, uh, need to to include. Um, probably. Um, uh, what we could say is that they should broadly follow also at local level what is uh, done at uh, uh, national level with the uh, with the comprehensive uh, uh, assessments. Um, it's very important uh, to involve uh, the actors uh, at uh, uh, local level because, of course, uh, there are uh, immediate effects uh, uh, to final uh, users in the uh, heat uh, uh, and cold. Um, but uh, it's also important to make sure that the involvement of the local actors is not only when the plans uh, are prepared uh, the first time, but that there is a continuous uh, uh, follow up uh, so that uh, uh, also every citizen living in the area covered by the planning is informed about uh, uh, the new energy supply options uh, uh, that become available. And of course, it is necessary for the uh, appropriate administrative and financial resources uh, to uh, to be ensured in order to uh, implement uh, uh, those plans. I see that uh, uh, my time is uh, really running uh, uh, out. Uh, I wanted uh, still, but I'll be uh, shorter than what I had originally planned. Um, I wanted still to talk uh, briefly about uh, uh, the heat pump uh, uh, action plan, uh, because this is uh, also an important strand of work uh, uh, that uh, uh, the Commission is uh, uh, covering uh, uh, at the moment, uh, because you know that uh, uh, in the Repower EU uh, plan, uh, there is also the initiative to uh, reach a rollout of 30 million heat pumps uh, before uh, 2030 and 10 million before 2027. And this is, of course, ambitious, but it's very important because this is necessary in order to ensure the transition uh, towards uh, a clean and decarbonized uh, uh, Europe. So this uh, um, uh, uh, heat pump uh, action plan is under preparation and the adoption uh, by the Commission is still uh, uh, planned uh, in the course of uh, uh, this year. Uh, it will contain a list of actions uh, um, uh, which uh, follow up uh, uh, what is uh, included in the uh, Repower EU uh, objectives. Uh, the plan has uh, four legs. Uh, there is a, a, a platform uh, accelerator partnership uh, between the Commission, the Member States and the sector uh, to uh, increase the cooperation and to uh, uh, exchange of best practices, uh, uh, training uh, uh, and so on. Uh, there is a, a strand uh, linked to communication and skills uh, because, of course, it is essential uh, to raise awareness and understanding uh, amongst the different players, amongst the stakeholders, uh, including in particular, obviously, the citizens. The third uh, uh, strand of action is the ongoing uh, legislative work uh, because, of course, uh, uh, policy de de uh, development has always the, uh, 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 let's say, the capacity to speed up uh, uh, the uptake uh, of uh, uh, new uh, initiatives and new technologies. And then the, fo the fourth strand that is important to recall is obviously the financing uh, because uh, it's uh, essen essential to have uh, at least a mapping of the financial possibilities uh, in order to make sure that uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, let's say uh, um, uh, the deployment, uh, I mean the results uh, are produced. With that, uh, I conclude um, by uh, 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 thanking you again for having invited me, uh, for wishing uh, uh, you a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, webinar. Um, I really apologize for the fact that I cannot uh, stay. Uh, but uh, uh, as agreed with Mr. Mrs. Uh, Pricken, um, I'll uh, stand ready to answer questions uh, uh, later on, should you have uh, any. And uh, uh, myself uh, and my colleagues are always uh, uh, happy to engage uh, in, in discussions uh, uh, anytime. Uh, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning and uh, for, for the time you took with us. Of course, feel free to uh, log off whenever you need to. Um, 
without further ado, I think we can uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Madsen, if you would like to share your screen, I will stop sharing mine. see it now we do indeed my screen yes good good yes. morning everybody um thanks for uh, being here uh and for having me here i will talk a little bit about the heating and cooling plants and uh the research we did um uh, as part of the european project the Garp city pipes uh, 2050 um i will just go quickly into what is a plan why do you need it how can you make it and some points of attention um so first uh first the bigger picture so we're we're in the whole process lens plan like that if you look at decarbonization of the heating and cooling demands basically you've got a few questions to ask so what what is possible so what is your energy demand now and uh, and in the future um, where do you want to go um uh, what kind of solutions are there for the city at what location and how and when are you going to do it? So what are transition roadmaps? So during this presentation, I will focus on the where question. So what are, what are the options where? So with that, a heating and cooling plan basically is a map showing spatially what options you have to deliver sustainable heating and cooling uh, for current, but also for future heating and cooling demand in your city. Um, some examples, uh, uh, this is the city of Munich, you see, uh, the city center, uh, the red part, it's it's a district heating. And on the outskirts, you see uh, groundwater heat pumps and solar thermal uh, energy as, as uh, solutions which they think is best to go forward to. Um, same kind of picture for the city of Rotterdam. Again, uh, again, red actually, district heating in the city center and the outskirts, um, uh, some other alternatives. In this map, there is a differentiated color. So the darker the color, the bigger the price difference is between district heating and the electric, electrical option. So basically the darker the color, the more robust the solution is. And the, if it's very light, then changes in price might shift the color of, of from district heating to um, uh, all electric solutions. Um, and then a third kind of map again, district heating and other uh, single uh, solutions or combination of microgrid uh, elements. Um, so so why why would you want to have a map like this? Uh, and, and basically it gives you direction, helps you to show direction and that's needed and, and I think helpful for look to relate to local options and impact and because planning is essential. If you look at the local options and impact, uh, it's, it's the map helps you to identify local energy sources. It helps you to identify where uh, the options are, but also how you can use it. Um, and it relates to, of course, your energy reduction options and uh, to supply technology. And the planning part is essential because, especially with district heating, you have high upfront costs and long payback periods, and you might end up with stunted assets like like replacement of the gas grid and long life cycles. So so. Thinking ahead makes sense um, in in um, in terms of the uh, heat transition. And then there are two other elements, which are the spatial and social challenges and op uh, opportunities, both from a local perspective, but also for the planning side. It makes sense to sort of be able to to grasp uh, what what they are and and to to plan them in time. So how how to go about getting one of those plans. Well, you need to gather data and information. Uh, it's very, very important to have a goal. Where, what, what do you want to achieve? Um, uh, luckily, we've got uh, some, some uh, guidelines already from EU, EU regulations where we want to end. Uh, um, um, another element of data and information is, is the current heating and cooling demands, uh, the heat and heat supply options and the quality of energy in, in which this, I mean, especially with heating, Having warm water at a temperature of 50 degrees has another quality of energy than having warm water delivered to you at 100 or 150 degrees. So, so it's in, important also to look at what uh, not just the, the amount of energy, but also the temperature of energy you, you have available. 
current energy systems, what is available, and what are your city developments and growth and renovations plan. And then you need to calculate and analyze this data. You have to change it into the future heat demand and supply options. Uh, look at the heat density per neighborhood, which is a very good guideline to look at where the district heating might be useful. Look at the heating and cooling ratio. If you have a lot of cooling demands, options like uh, heating and cooling storage makes more sense than if you have very little cooling demand. Um, you can look at the total cost per solution. So, so you look basically at the cost at buildings level. Um, plus the cost at systems level. And, and depending on what type of solutions you have, if you have a district heating system with mid or higher term um, uh, temperatures, you probably have higher costs in, in systems level. You have to develop a whole new district heat, heating system. But at buildings level, you, you can be very cost efficient in, in insulating. However, you go to this heat pumps and low temperature solutions, you probably need to do, especially with the older buildings, you probably have higher cost of building level and maybe lower cost of system level since there's a way the electricity grid. This is not in all situations true. I mean, if you have new buildings, well insulated, your costs are low in the buildings anyway. Uh, if your electricity grid is not up to speed, then your system, system costs will be high even with electrification. So it's it, you have to really look into the details of your own system. Uh, then, then finally... Yes. Sorry to, to interrupt you. Um, I have had some uh, messages saying that, uh, unfortunately, you're a bit far from your microphone. Do you think you could uh, oh. readjust a bit so uh, they can hear you yes. a bit louder? Yes, I will talk a bit louder. I hope that helps. And otherwise, please let me know because... Uh, um... All right. Awesome. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, I will do my best to be loud. <laughs> um... Yes, so I was I was telling about the calculation and analysis, and and you have to look also. Thank you. You can see thumbs up. Good. Um, buildings, building stock uh, analysis. So so what is possible and what are the options within the building stock? Because not everything is possible. Um, and look at the spatial impact of the choices you make. Um, so if you then look at the process of going. Uh, uh, going through it, you 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 have to start with stakeholder involvement, and and I think it was mentioned in the previous two. It's it's good to look at who do you need to involve, and so the local local working group can be both the the technical uh, and uh, energy companies, but it can also be citizens involvement. So you have to look at what makes sense at what time to involve people because if you're too early, it's too vague. People don't get really, you know, part of the the whole discussion. Uh, if you're too late, then you're too late. So, so this is this is a balance you have to figure out um, each time and within your own own city. Uh, what is important is that that from that stakeholder involvement and from the city council, you get a clear goal and principles as a starting point. Then you can start working on data gathering, validation, aggregation, analyzing, etc as mentioned before, and from there you can start mapping, uh, setting out limiting criteria, what, what do you find important, and, and then you work towards your heating and cooling plan. The plan itself is not the solution yet. You have to translate it into a roadmap, uh, how you're going to do it. So that basically is, again, the phases I started with, with the what, where, how, and when. And especially towards the transition roadmap, the stakeholder involvement is getting bigger and more important because then you start to, to you know, ask and, and act on changes. Um, some points of attention while making a map, energy efficient is not always the same as cost efficient. I mean, I can uh, insulate my house to almost zero, uh, which is very energy efficient, but it's very expensive to make those less steps. So that's something to keep in mind. The second thing is what the solution for one is not the solution for all. There are different situation. And, and so it's not a one size fits all solution you can just put on a map. Um, the social aspects do matter. Um, third, theoretical is not actual. This is uh, the performance gap may be known to you. And uh, labels uh, mean uh, well insulated. I don't know if you see it, it's um, the the houses are well insulated and and G labels are badly insulated, and the theoretical consumption just drops nicely down. 
but actually you see that that consumption does drop but not that much because people in badly insulated houses are in general not heating all their rooms they're just you know they're they're just reading up their living room well if you have a wealthy insulated house people start to also uh, heat up their attic or their bathroom or so they're actually the consumption is is very often higher than the theoretical consumption your payback period then differs from theory to actual so that's something you have to keep in mind then another point of attention is that short-term optimist model is long-term resilient so so quick wins are nice but sometimes they do not fit the bigger picture i'll come back to that later and and uh, finally, the total cost is not always the individual cost or the lowest total cost. Maybe you say in this area you need district heating. There might be a house in between where the individual solution of heat heat pumps are are cheaper. So so even within those broad calculations of heating and cooling maps, you might have exceptions. So it's also good to calculate with a connection uh, level, for example, eighty percent, where you have those individual alternatives that it's still possible. Um, and then some, finally, some last point of attention is, is time changes. I mean, you pay, make a plan based on, on the data and information you have at this moment, but things change. I mean, we have seen it recently extreme. For example, when you have rising costs in energy or materials or both. Um, and what can happen is two things. Basically, you can have your heating and cooling plan and you had your optimal combination. And suddenly, because of changing uh, cost, your your uh, type of solution might change. Uh, and, and so your plan sort of changes from color. Um, the other thing that might happen is that there's a focus on the short-term solution. For example, you start to focus much more on insulation. while it doesn't really fit the the the, the, the the direction you made. So what is important when you make those heating and cooling plans is that you're really transparent. So what assumptions did you make so that if something changed, you know what the, the consequence might be. And, and that relates also to the second point is that, that you make a sensitivity analysis. So you look you look at what are the big the big influencers. So if if price is the biggest key then it's very important to maybe do a sensitive like some margin in in okay margins within your planning so if, if it changes a little bit then then we don't have uh, uh, a big change but if it's a lot then we we have to recalculate so you know which which areas are more reviews than the others and finally you have to try to work towards a resilience approach meaning look at how to make systems to a certain point flexible redundant learn from uh, developments. Um, and I think having a planning, heating and cooling plan with all the data and analyze behind it helps you to make make such a resilient uh, approach. Um, so this is a very fast uh, uh, presentation on heating and cooling. And if you would like to have more information, please visit our website. And I will be around for the Q&A. So. Thank you very much, Astrid. Indeed, uh, if uh, anyone has questions for for uh, for you, they should be uh, writing them in the chat. If you could also specify to which of the speakers uh, your question is destined to, that would ease uh, very much the the job of the moderation. Um, I think we should uh, move on with Thomas Love uh, if he's ready. Yes, he is, as always. Sure. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, Clemence, for the introduction. And I think the presentation I'm about to hold uh, is, is a very nice continuation of what Astrid has just uh, presented. So I will give you some insights into the in-plan project, which basically aims to empower uh, local and regional governments in the actual implementation of uh, the various plans, goals, strategies uh, that they have uh, within their borders. Just to give some uh, uh, some some initial uh, thoughts, uh, cities and regions are extremely complex entities. Uh, there is a lot of interaction, a lot of uh, material and non-material elements that need to be considered. There's a lot of construction, architecture. There's of course a lot of infrastructure, both in the terms of energy, mobility, but also green and blue. 
Uh, but there's also a lot of uh, non-material elements that need to be taken into account. For instance, cultural heritage, uh, ownership, laws, and so on and so forth. So this is overall incredibly complex with many layers of planning, many layers of implementation. So the whole process, again, can be incredibly complicated. And when we talk about uh, then the implementation of uh, a variety of measures to the implementation of the energy transition or uh, climate change adaptation, climate change resilience topics, uh, there's a whole uh, range, there's, there's a wide range of challenges that cities and regions face. First and foremost, there is uh, very often a lack of capacity and mechanisms to actually enact and enforce uh, energy and climate policies on the local and regional level. Uh, in some cases where you have very strong regions in a country, for instance, Italy or Germany come to mind, then this regional level might not be such a big issue. In some cases, in some cities like Vienna, which uh, do have capacities uh, like states, they can pass their own laws. So again, they don't uh, suffer from these challenges as much. But in many other cities, in many other countries, actually uh, creating binding and enforceable uh, regulation is quite difficult at the local and regional level. And a lot of this is delegated to the national level. Uh, the second big challenge is that we often face a uh, lack of vertical and horizontal integration or at least alignment of strategies, plans and policies, meaning that there is still very much so a, uh, a silo approach when it comes to planning, when it comes to governance and when it comes to implementation. Uh, this can cause uh, a misalignment between plans, it can cause uh, cities to miss potential synergies. So there's a lot of negatives that can happen from this and uh, integrating or at least aligning such plans can provide a lot of benefits. Uh, there is also a lack of systemic and integrated and consistent approaches uh, to energy and climate planning as well. So we've seen uh, in the previous presentation some options for heat planning, uh, but these types of plans also need to be properly integrated with the wider uh, view of the city in terms of its energy and climate. Again, the synergies and potential uh, maladaptations need to be considered, taken into account, and also integrated in such plans. And then finally, and maybe one of the biggest issues is that there is uh, usually a lack of alignment between the planning processes and the allocation of uh, financial and other resources to actually implement them, meaning that in many cases, the developed plans are not really much more than wish lists because they're not backed up by sufficient resources to actually implement them. Oh, sorry. Uh, so in short, there is very often a strong misalignment between planning and implementation. Uh, cities have a lot of tools for the development of plans. Uh, there's a lot of plans available to them, both at a national, European level, and so on. Uh, but there is very often a lack of tools to actually implement set plans. Uh, when we talk about uh, the plans that cities have in terms of energy, the, the one that comes to mind most often is a sustainable energy and climate action plan which is an incredibly valuable tool, which provides a very good overview of the city's current energy demands, as well as its uh, emissions. Uh, it gives uh, very uh, strictly defined targets. It gives a pathway from the current situation towards uh, the final goal. But again, there is a lack of enforcement that, uh, that uh, there's, sorry, there's a lack of enforcement to actually achieve everything uh, that is set out. Uh, when we talk about the actual implementation, there is one type of plan that cities do have at their disposal that functions both as a planning, but also as an implementation and an enforcement mechanism, and that is uh, spatial planning. So spatial plans are very common across Europe. I think more or less every country in, in Europe, every country in the world basically uses them to define the development of a city or a region within, uh, within a given territory. Uh, and what is most important about them is that they are binding and they are uh, enforceable. So basically, once something is stated 
in a spatial plan, that something becomes law and it's very difficult to go about it. A building cannot really get a building permit if it isn't aligned with its relevant spatial plan. Uh, spatial plans are also aligned at various levels. So there's even national plans in some cases, regional uh, city plans, urban suburban plans, all with their uh, degree of uh, resolution, detail, and so on. And again, they all need to be aligned within themselves. Uh, spatial plans also do consider energy and climate as elements within them. Uh, so at the bare minimum, uh, spatial plans will define zones of, for instance, green infrastructure or zones of, en or, or sorry, the paths of energy infrastructure and location uh, for that en energy infrastructure. Uh, unfortunately, it rarely goes much beyond those two points. Uh, here on the picture on your right, uh, you can see a, a snippet of one of Croatia, one of one Croatian city's uh, spatial plans and the uh, energy layer of it. And in green, you can see uh, uh, the distribution of the natural gas grid. Yellow is the planned gas grid. And in red, you can see the distribution of the district heating grids. Uh, the first visual element that usually bothers me in such plans is that uh, red is a heating and green is uh, natural gas. Green very often means good, red means bad. So this is a, a very, very effective visual uh, cue to show you uh, some of the priorities that, 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 that exist in certain countries, in certain uh, planning uh, practices. But the other more practical thing that usually bothers me in such pictures is you can see that there's a, almost a complete overlap between uh, the gas lines and the district heating lines, uh, which is, of course, bad because natural gas and district heating are direct competitors. There's no synergies in them being one next to another. And basically such a layout... Uh, such a layout causes inefficiencies in both. And it makes it quite difficult to degasify an area if natural gas is so uh, readily uh, available. Uh, and this is basically where in plan, uh, the, the project that I'm presenting here comes into play. Uh, the overall objective behind in plan is to develop, test and roll out the so-called in plan practice, which is uh, in essence, a support structure for integrated planning. And the idea behind that is that we want to empower and enable local and regional authorities to integrate uh, energy, climate, and spatial planning. So this basically means that uh, we are trying to uh, facilitate uh, that spatial plans become a central pillar for planning and uh, through that also enforcement and implementation of not just the spatial development uh, uh, plans and strategies and ambitious ambitions of a, a region or a city, but also their energy and climate policies. Uh, this can go beyond just energy and climate. It can also include uh, mobility and infrastructure. It all depends on the uh, ambitions and the scope of, of the overall process. And the second element within the project is we are also aiming to empower and build up capacities, both in the participating local and regional governments, but also in uh, the regional uh, energy, climate and uh, development is supporting them so that uh, this process can, that can be implemented together with the local regional uh, governments, with their supporting agencies, and with the spatial planners, urbanists, and so on that are usually the ones developing these spatial plans. And finally, uh, we are also aiming to facilitate the matching of the measures with local and regional budget lines, meaning that if something is created created as a plan, if something is, sorry, if, if a measure is added into a plan, if there is a set goal, adequate resources need to be planned out for that goal to actually be achieved because without that, uh, we're nowhere. Uh, the practice is currently being tested out in five pilot countries. So in Ireland, Sweden, Romania, Croatia, and Italy, each of those countries has a very, a very different uh, planning uh, or spatial planning history, there's a lot of differences in the spatial planning uh, process. So basically, through this, we are trying to see uh, how well the, the practice can function within different environments. We are trying to get our feedback, and we are uh, trying to bring this all together. Uh, a, dr a draft practice uh, has been created, and we are now basically rolling out the capacity building uh, 
and the capacity building for uh, agencies in parallel with the capacity building we are doing for our cities and regions. Uh, I think a first call for the capacity building of, uh, of potential multipliers, so meaning agencies working with uh, local and regional governments will be launched uh, sometime this week. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about this process or more in depth about this process, uh, have an eye out uh, for, for, for an email with this. Uh, how does this process uh, function in practice? Uh, it is deceptively simple and uh, very straightforward. The basic idea is to go through your varying uh, strategies, plans for a city. For instance, your uh, a heating plan, something like uh, what we, what is now what will be required uh, through the new EED, or something developed through an activity like uh, decarb city pipes. Identify elements that could be integrated with spatial plans and that you have issues uh, with enforcing. Uh, translate them into a language suitable uh, to uh, urban planning, spatial planning. This is where uh, help from urbanists and spatial planners comes into play and integrate that into your spatial plan. So this can be anything from a flat out ban on the use of fossil fuels across the city for all new construction or in a specific zone or for a specific building type. Uh, this can also mean a higher standard of energy efficiency for all new buildings, all refurbished buildings as well, uh, or only residential buildings, only public buildings. The, the options are quite wide. Again, targeting the whole city, a certain zone and so on. Uh, there's also a lot of elements for uh, climate change adaptation and climate change resilience that can be added here. Uh, for instance, mandatory uh, use of uh, water retention zones within uh, within certain areas of the city, uh, mandatory use of uh, rainwater, for instance. Uh, again, the, the list is fairly, uh, fairly uh, uh, long and there's a lot of options uh, here. Uh, the in-plan practice itself uh, and the overall process uh, uh, has been structured in five uh, overarching steps uh, due to the time that we have now I won't go uh, too much into detail here but I just like to highlight a few so basically uh, it, it all starts from an initial analysis as I've said screening of all of the existing strategies document documents looking at bad, best practices uh, seeing what are your uh, uh, legislative what is your legislative framework if there's any barriers that simply cannot be overcome and so on and so forth uh, there needs to be a common understanding of the problems, goals, and visions between you, the spatial planners, and of course the city, because without political will, uh, this process will be very difficult uh, to, 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 uh, to realize. Uh, in some cases, you will need to develop additional feasibility studies, develop uh, certain maps, de develop the argumentation for why certain measures need to be implemented in a way that they are. Uh, and of course, we then need to draft the plan itself and then go through the entire process of uh, 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 verifying it and uh, getting it passed through all of the political bodies that need to do so. And the whole process needs to be underpinned by consistent and constant communication between all of the relevant stakeholders, the city, the spatial planners, and so on and so forth. And just to conclude some of the results we've had so far, so as I've said, this uh, this, this approach uh, is being tested in several cities across the five partner countries. And again, sorry, when I say cities, I mean cities and regions. Uh, the initial results are quite promising. We already have certain elements of what I've said being integrated and even fully voted through uh, some sub-municipal spatial plans in a few cases, meaning that we do have precedents for this being possible in some countries. And this is now actually uh, being turned into reality. Uh, there are some uh, barriers, of course, mostly in terms of the understanding and the awareness of the overall uh, process, usually stemming from uh, the current planning practices, not really considering uh, everything that I've mentioned uh, in, in uh, much uh, detail. We also have some limitations in certain cases. Uh, where basically there's national laws preventing from higher standards being integrated into spatial plans, meaning that you cannot go beyond what is written in, for instance, your standard for uh, building uh, efficiency. Uh, 
Uh, as I've said, a draft in plan practice has been created and is being used, as well as the draft uh, capacity building plan. Uh, so the idea is to pass on the knowledge of how and why to actually integrate spatial uh, energy and climate planning. As I've said, we're focusing primarily on energy, climate and development agencies, but other entities that work with uh, cities, regions that support them in their development are also welcome. And the first round of this capacity building, which will be virtual for now, there will be live sessions down the line as well, will most likely happen uh, during November. There will be more information shared about this very soon. The idea behind this is to have very small groups. Uh, so we're aiming at 10-ish people uh, with a lot of practical work and direct coaching from the project partners to try and pass uh, this knowledge onwards. So again, uh, if you're interested in this, uh, have your eyes open for uh, for an email, uh, mostly most likely coming from Federer. Uh, that is it from my side. Uh, feel free to follow the project and get in touch with me if you have any additional questions or comments. And back to you, Clemence. Thank you so much, Tomislav. Thank you also for the advertisement for the trainer trainers. Uh, so next, last speaker, Dominique, uh, I give you the floor. Yes, you're ready. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So I'm Dominique van de Wiele, and uh, I'm working for Intermunicipal Association. That's an association of 13 cities and municipalities in, uh, in Belgium. Um, so, but I'm representing the Connect Heat project here, and the Connect Heat project. Well, this is uh, a project about connecting. Well, it's about heat, um, but also thinking about can what is the role of thermal energy communities. So, this is a project that we do with several partners uh, throughout uh, Europe. It's um, a live project, and of course, I won't repeat what uh, the previous speakers have said. Uh, setting up uh, district heating and the district heating planning is quite complex. A lot of uh, interests are involved. It's uh, setting up these uh, these infrastructures. It is not easy. It is a long-term project, and we're in a full transition. Of course, as the first speaker said, we have to reduce carbon emissions via uh, district heating as well. So here, the role about citizens in this whole transition, this is uh, the challenging part of uh, the Connect Heat uh, project. Now, look into uh, spatial planning and energy planning. I think I uh, will uh, we'll, we'll make my explanation uh, throughout uh, several uh, examples here presented. Um, I won't go into detail uh, here, but in the process uh, as an organization, as Leidal, uh, being partner of the Connected project we went through, is that we created a uh, vision on how to get every uh, house, every uh, building on the long term, how to get them climate neutral, because that's the real challenge. And in 2030, okay, we have this minus 40% by 2030. Uh, that's what we engaged in via the Covenant of Mayors. Um, but on the long term, you also have to have this vision. Now, uh, basically, we don't have a lot of uh, district heating. We more or less have none of it. So shown as the in the presentation of Astrid um, in the, from the Decarp City Pipes project, we followed more or less the same um, methodologies. Um, versus like kind of an inventory. Where is really uh, the, the, the heat demand situated? And then you come to maps like these uh, stating um, these are zones, the, the dark red zones are the zones that are um, suitable, have the potential for district heating. Nowadays, there is almost no district heating. It's uh, merely uh, done with natural gas. And the lighter, the, 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 or, uh, the light orange ones, then are the zones where you know, well, there is no, not enough uh, density there district heating probably won't be a solution here or at least not a district heating as we know it uh, for today so here we think it's rather will be um full electric solution on long term and on long term as well if we want to become climate neutral we don't believe that there will be a big role uh, to the, the the gas grid network for biogas it will there will be biogas but the amounts will be so small and we won't need to you we can't use that for uh, just heating up dwelling so we're in this full transition um 
creating these kinds of plans. Also, we can focus on city centers, um, thinking about what's if we develop district heating, then what would be the the most interesting buildings to connect? And then here you see the the importance again of local authorities because we spotted especially all the public buildings being the larger buildings having a large en uh, energy co consumption, but you can easily engage them uh, on long term and they will remain there. If you look into com uh, companies, this is much more uh, difficult. They don't have these long term visions, but schools, hospitals, swimming pools, uh, etc., public administrations, we can ex assume that a lot of these still will be there on long term. So these are really the good basis to start work with. So, uh, as uh, Mr. Novosel uh, already explained, the lack of enforcement is a difficult one. So we can do the planning on one side, but then we need to implement it. And that's a very difficult one. Um, so let's now try to jump into uh, some examples um, of how we could uh, implement it. And these are pilot projects that we are uh, running. But perhaps first look into the whole idea of, of Connect Heat in which we have this new figure, energy communities, renewable energy communities, that also could play a role in it. Because here we see um, very briefly what is a renewable energy community. So basically, it's now kind of a new concept that is introduced by the European Commission uh, in two directives. It is implemented. This one, renewable energy communities, is the one that has been implemented in uh, the renewable energies uh, directive. So here it is a legal entity that is controlled by stakeholders, and the stakeholders are the natural persons, citizens, SMEs, or local authorities. So it is nothing something about um, the um, the energy sector can control. No, this is this is the idea that you have the um, the individual citizen can do a lot of things, but groups of citizens also, or groups or, or local authorities can also play a more active role in this energy transition. But the purpose is done not to bring financial profits, but rather uh, environmental, social, or economic benefits um, for society. And the activities they can undertake, they can involve in, in all types of activities. Most of the focus now these days with uh, energy communities is on electricity, but uh, renewable energy, energy communities can also involve being involved in district heating and cooling. So it is allowed and there is a kind of a concept uh, to involve uh, them uh, there. So let's look into uh, that. How could we uh, do it? I give you uh, two pilots, two, uh, two examples. This one is a, um, in a village um, that has a lot of uh, public buildings uh, close by. And there was a big plan to get uh, a part of the street out of, um, out of the, there and to create a large park. Since there is um, um, a home for elderly, a school, and other public buildings around it, this created an opportunity to think how could these, all these existing buildings become climate neutral on long term? And the proposal was there to work with a borehole uh, energy storage system. So basically, these are drillings of about 60 meters deep um, under the park, the newly created park. So there are a lot of public works there ongoing. Um, so Immediately, uh, this is already drilled, so there are a lot of, I think, 122 uh, holes there uh, connected. And basically, what um, what does it do? Um, this borehole thermal uh, energy storage is kind of a seasonal storage of excess heat that exists in summer because you need to cool down buildings, so you cool them uh, and you put the heat into the ground. And in winter, you do the reverse. Then you need the heat. The heat that you has been stored um, in the in the summer because you need then the cold. The, then then you um, then you get it out again in winter, and you put the coldness back into the ground. So basically, that that's what the system does. So you need a lot of heat pumps. This is a very low temperature system. Um, because the, your heat pumps create uh, the heat that you actually need, but what is stored into the ground is really at lower temperatures. So then you you cool down, for example, uh, the underground to one or two degrees at maximum, uh, and in in, wind, in summertime it can raise up uh, to to 15 uh, degrees. Okay. Um, 
The difficulty here was that you have different public um, players. Uh, schools are different organizations, and municipality are different organization than a um, than a than a than a home for um, uh, elderly. Uh, so you need to kind of come to this type of energy community. And it is not, uh, it's not easy thing to do uh, because uh, who owns the ground? Uh, you need to make a lot of contractual uh, arrangements. Um, if you share this whole set of pipes, who puts the heat in it? Who gets it back out? Uh, who owns uh, the, the heat pumps, uh, etc.? Who is doing the management of uh, this heat, making sure that in summer enough heat is going putting underground, in winter that you don't get too much heat out of it? So really, this is a, a complex scheme, also uh, linked with the, with the whole business model, and it is quite complex to do. But uh, it is allowed via um, um, uh, this uh, this whole concept of uh, energy communities that local authorities, uh, in this sense, work together around one system and uh, we're working on it to uh, establish uh, this uh, model so these are the works of uh, the drillings there you see this machine putting uh, the pipes into the ground a second case i want to show you is about um, thermal heat in a new neighborhood um, this is a kind of a special project again again it's about this uh, this idea of uh, I would say fifth generation district heating low temperature because in our region i forgot to mention that there is there are no big sources of uh waste heat or um well if you there are no district there's no district heating so it wouldn't make sense to start building some big um thermal boilers running on on gas or even on biomass we immediately can look into what has the the um, the, the area, the, the surrounding, what, what, what has the context to offer as sources of heat and, 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 and cool and uh, cold. So this one uh, is a, a very particular source. This is a main drink water pipe uh, offering um, the drinking water to a city. Um, so it has a constant flow of water um, and a high flow. And which means that it has a regenerating, re, in thermal uh, point of view, it has a regenerating uh, capacity. So if you get the heat out of that pipe and you get two or four, four degrees out of it, two kilometers further, the water is flowing, it regenerates because of its kind of a, a, a geothermal um, uh, principle. So what we basically do is this main drink water pipe, we put a heat exchanger on it, we get the heat out of it and we put a low temperature, we call it a neutral grid, um, uh, district heating. And one could say, is it really a district heating? No, it's really district heating and cooling because the temperature it will run on, it's about 10, 12 degrees seasonal. It can vary. Um, so it's not insulated pipes, but every building, every dwelling will have its own heat pump and get the heat or cold out of that network. So basically we can get 230 kilowatts um, from uh, this main drink water pipe with a delta T of four degrees. Perhaps in future we can increase the delta T to, uh, to six degrees. But this is the first uh, test project as well for the drink water uh, company. So they want to be sure that uh, the quality of the drink water is secured. So this will serve about 30 uh, dwellings and uh, 10 very small uh, business uh, units. Then uh, small SMEs, and we will uh, build this um, this drink water network there. So basically, this is the the technical scheme. So we have the drink water pipe, the heat exchanger there uh, gets the 15 degrees out of it, and the heat pump will uh, increase it unto 40 degrees for heating um, the the house or the the SME, and with um, with a booster, you can ha have even more. Uh, it's again a, a, a booster, a, a heat pump booster. You can go to higher uh, temperatures, but then the heat pumps will, um, in, in the district heating, put the 12 degrees there back. And this, the heat exchanger, will put uh, reduce the temperature in the drink water pipe, and uh, this will regenerate. Even in summer, you can use this 15 degrees, or it will be even lower, um, for direct uh, cooling of the dwelling. So you don't need to really need the heat pump. You could use a bypass. So basically, uh, it is uh, uh, these works are ongoing. The the bypass has been created, but uh, of course, uh, the the big challenge is. 
uh, this is a new neighborhood. Um, so in thinking in terms of an energy community, how to involve um, the community. So a lot of infrastructure works, a lot of decisions need to be taken in advance, even without that it is known who exactly will own the, the dwelling. So you need to take a lot of decisions. And here, um, the developer uh, takes these uh, engagements to make it uh, climate neutral, this, uh, this new neighborhood. And also the engagement of um, having the citizens involved, making them uh, as their system, because what we learned during the energy crisis, that uh, district heating was some district heating um, networks followed the gas prices although it is not the the fuel source not always is gas in this case there is no fuel source except for the electricity needed and here we want to have a cost plus model a cost model um, so only the the real tangible costs are that are made for supplying that heat and for maintaining that network are charged toward to the to the users so they will use, they will own the system and they will uh, use it. So some conclusions. Um, okay, I think the first point, the establishment of district heating, it is, uh, it is very complex and it requires capacity. Therefore, thinking about who will develop um, community-based thermal uh, energy systems, uh, district heating, we believe that it will be very difficult to say, okay, but the, the, the future residents or the citizens will have the lead here in the full development. There will be a, a role, an important role, uh, for example, for the local authority um, to really to facilitate the development of these type of uh, district heating schemes. The regulation on energy communities merely offers a new vision about how citizens could be involved in the energy, energy transition and to create this type of shared energy systems However, as for today, what we see that there is no specific advantage if you do it together. You can do it, but then the same rules apply as for everybody. Um, so there is no re a real uh, concept available for uh, thermal energy communities. Last observation, last conclusion is that fifth generation heating systems are rather hybrid. So we have the uh, challenge, for we, we are in the situation that we do not have uh, district heating available uh, yet, which means that we immediately can look into these renewable energy systems. And these are hybrids because the heat pump plays an important role, but it offers also the solution, uh, the opportunity to really to look into the environment, what is around and to be creative on what could be the source. Here it is a drink water pipe. It is a park that uh, that 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 you put uh, the the borehole ten, uh, the, the vertical borehole energy uh, system. But we're also working, for example, on a project to use the the waste heat from um, a wastewater treatment uh, plant. So wastewater is treated, is cleaned up, and due, due to the bacteria there, water heats a little bit up, and you can use that uh, uh, elevated heat. Uh, with the heat pump again to heat uh, buildings. So it challenges you, this energy transition, to look to it with a different view uh, towards uh, your environment and to see how projects can, can emerge. Now the challenge is to involve citizens uh, in it and not uh, in, in these types of system, systems won't be the big systems that are city or region wide. There will be rather small scale trying to balance heat um, in the winter and summer. Okay, this was my uh, presentation. In case there are questions, I think we will discuss them afterwards. Actually, it is time for Q&A. So um, uh, I see that in the chat, uh, it's been, uh, there has been some questions already answered and discussed. Uh, regarding uh, um, uh, tool planning, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I don't know if Astrid, I think most of the questions were directed to you. Do you want maybe to give a, a very, very quick uh, summary of uh, of the questions that you, you yeah. encountered? Um, I yes, remember, so, um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Oh, okay, good, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so the first question was about simulation tools, whether they were used. I think, simulation, I think yeah. In, in, in general, I mean, it, 
depends a bit on what your definition of heat and cooling plan is. If it's is it sort of the end image, then you don't use a simulation tool. You use it basically more to to get the, the roadmap there. So how do you get there, and what kind of different elements are there? So so it is useful to to have. Um, but if you really look at at the definition of a heating cooling plan as as how does what are what is a potential end view, then then it's usually not used. But but it is used in different ways. And and for example, I gave the uh, example of the Rotterdam Hague region where we use it as as a growing model to see how you can sort of grow into into the um, end picture or mm. different kind of end picture, so you can have different scenarios. So so I think. Simulation tools are useful to to look at different options uh, in general. And the other question I think was um, let me see on on uh, the the difference um, the the viability of district heating compared to other. Yes, mm -hmm. that's the the main thing you do with district heating uh, with the heating and cooling planning is you look at the different options. What you use in your calculation obviously depends on on what you think is important as a uh, as elements, so um, I think it's it's um, it it differs maybe a little bit, but in general, um, it's there's looked at the whole set of of costs uh, from one alternative to the other. Uh, and this during the presentation, I will said it's useful to look at the sensitivity. So so what if there's a little change? Does it have a big effect on your or your heating and cooling plan or not. And I think mm -hmm. that has a lot to do with, with costs. And I think there's one last question about whether we looked at the urban space. I think that's very important because there are some areas where you have, for example, nature reserve, or if you have, uh, as in the Netherlands, we have dikes that, that makes it much more deep, more expensive to cross or, or even it's not allowed because of the safety. So so there are elements which, which may not allow you to have district heating and you have to keep that in mind when you make the plans because if you're, if you have uh, a source and, and a potential supply area, uh, but you cannot connect it, then obviously you have it's not useful to 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 work on that. So yeah, urban urban space is very important element in in planning the planning tool. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you had any last comments, recommendations uh, that you wanted to share since since you've been opening the, the <laughs> session already. Yes, well, I, I think I think what we now see in the Netherlands is that the electricity grid is really um, there's electricity congestion. So basically, we cannot uh, we don't have that much space left on our current electricity grid to add more demand or supply of electricity. So changing towards heat pumps in such certain areas is just not possible. So so it's not just uh, so there's another element to it, and and uh, reinforcing the electricity grid is also a spatial um, element uh, attached to it, and especially in dense urban areas, sometimes mm -hmm. that's very hard. So you, you there's well, I, I think um, uh, it was also mentioned in in the previous uh, uh, um, presentations that there's a, a lot more elements related to to making the plans, and, and I think the spatial impact is is one of them, and and. Well, in the Netherlands, we see that having uh, uh, that electricity grid being congested is is very big push towards other alternatives. Thank you. Um, actually, so speaking of the spatial uh, aspect, I think uh, to to Miss Love, you would be uh, um, the best for me to to answer this next question. Like uh, in 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 plan. Um, you are trying to in, to um, incorporate and to include uh, within the whole integration process um, the spatial planners, the uh, urbanists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how do you see, like, what reactions did they have when you came first with this uh, proposal to have integrated plans? Sure. Uh, I can share most of the experiences we've had in Croatia because, well, we, I am coordinating the project, but I'm also implementing it primarily in Croatia. So the urbanists and spatial planners we've talked to like the idea quite a lot because it, they, they also recognize it as a tool for cities and regions to actually, again, take control 
uh, and take ownership uh, over their own development. And this is also, they, they also see it as, as I mentioned, as an enforcement tool that can help facilitate the actual implementation of measures. Uh, I'm coming back to the general problem that uh, we've been facing as an agency for quite a while already. And that actually is how do you move from plans to implementation? Um, selfishly, they also like the idea because it does give them more importance as well, because this basically expands the scope of their work as well. So this also raises uh, their uh, profile quite a bit. So this is another reason why the reaction was positive. Mm -hmm. And I can also mention that from a national legislative point of view, the approach has also been recognized by some ministries as a potentially <laughs> useful tool to facilitate the achievement of national targets as well, because most of the national targets that, that get passed uh, are usually then referred to the cities, the regions to actually implement uh, bottom up. So overall, the reception for this approach was quite positive. The only, uh, let's say, negative responses we've received are planners, cities and regions uh, who aren't exactly sure if what we are talking about is legally possible. And for now, the answer in uh, almost every case was it is. Uh, it's just a matter of how to phrase it, how to back it up and how to communicate it properly. Okay, thank you. Um, I see in the chat a, a question for, for Dominique regarding the uh, renewable energy communities. Uh, so it was, um, how did you address the challenge uh, for Rex to obtain credits in case of Rex doing uh, the investments? Uh, so yeah, quite the financial uh, challenges that you have faced. Um, it is a difficult, um... Thing. So you come to the conclusion that in, the, in an ideal world, there is a group of citizens that uh, in a, their neighborhoods start thinking, well, how can we decarp our, um, our environment, our dwellings? However, there are a lot of lock-ins by the moment they live there. They are having made their choice of their heating system. Um, there is a gas grid that has a payback time over long term, etc. So then it becomes very difficult. What we see now what we're trying to do with um, this project uh, in this new neighborhood. It's making the right choices immediately. It doesn't make sense to make to put a lot of infrastructure in the ground. Sadly, this is way too expensive. However, you come to then to this this strange observation, of course, that there are no citizens there to to yeah to to invest in it. So basically, here it 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 follows the same logic as in a lot of other logics. Um, in which uh, the developer uh, here puts the, the infrastructures into the ground. And um, when these infrastructures are, um, when the, 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 the dwellings are sold, as a matter of fact, the residents pay and buy in uh, and, and pay for the, the costs that were needed for the infrastructures, being it uh, electricity grids, uh, telecommunications, uh, uh, sewage, water. That's very standard. And here, they, when they buy their uh, house or their lot, then they pay as well for the infrastructures that are provided, but they become a co-owner of the system. So that's the point they come in. So here you could say, okay, the initiative is not with the citizens. However, uh, it is not possible to put the initiative with the citizens. That's the observation that we made. Uh, however, citizens are free to choose to buy uh, to buy their dwelling there and to buy uh, to buy in. So there, there is a kind of a free choice to uh, to choose for uh, for that system. Okay, um, I hope that Geinacht uh, is satisfied with the <laughs> with your answer. Um, I have here. Actually, I'm sorry. I'm I'm, I'm jumping. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't manage to to have a kind of. Uh, red line, as we say in French, uh, but uh, so there's a new question for, for Tomislav, um, which is, um, do you see a possibility to incorporate your methodology uh, in national framework for uh, local heating and cooling planning are being established? Uh, yeah, so do you see it at the national uh, framework? 
Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, the so I, I think this this question uh, maybe has uh, two parts to it. So one, how to integrate this uh, this question to the national level, and second, how to combine it with the new requirements for local heating and cooling planning uh, envisioned by the EED. For the national level, uh, of course, uh, I, I think it will be difficult to integrate concrete measures at the level of national spatial plans. However, what I absolutely see as a potential would be to uh, emphasize a stronger uh, level of integration of energy and climate aspects into spatial planning. So basically making such a, a practice, a, a, a legal requirement at a, a European or a national level. Uh, and uh, when, when talking about heating and cooling planning, I absolutely see spatial plans as a vital instrument here. So again, through this uh, directive, through the requirements of it, uh, cities and regions of a certain size will have to create this heating and cooling plans. And it is foreseen that there are some supports elements at the national level to actually facilitate their, their uh, achievement, their implementation. But I still believe that that will be very difficult without proper enforcement. And again, using spatial plans to, for instance, define that uh, within a certain area, all new buildings cannot use uh, fossil fuels for space heating and the preparation of domestic hot water is a very, very uh, clear message that can be sent. It's a very clear limitation that can be placed. And using uh, the results of these heating and cooling plans, as well as all of the various political decisions, the ED all of the various national uh, laws, targets, and so on, uh, such a measure can be argued. Uh, the reason, again, why this needs to be placed in a spatial plan is a city can mandate the, uh, can, can, can directly implement the measures within buildings that the city owns. Uh, the national level can implement such measures at the level, uh, in buildings that they own. But you also need to motivate the investors of resident in, in residential buildings. You need to uh, motivate homeowners. You need to motivate businesses to do the switch. And again, spatial plans can do the trick. So I absolutely see uh, there. Uh, I absolutely see a lot of interaction happening between these plans and uh, future spatial plans. Thank you. Um, I would like to finish. Yeah, we have two minutes left. Um, I want to finish with the, the question from uh, David Bourguignon, uh, which was quite general, uh, but I think very interesting, especially to have your uh, different uh, experiences. It is uh, when local authorities are using heat planning, are they more interested in mapping potential heat production consumption in an area, or um, are they already thinking about uh, district heating and cooling uh, deployment solutions? I don't know who of you wants to answer first. Um, I can, yeah, since I, I was talking already, so yeah. I, can, I can finish up and then stop talking. Uh, so from my personal experience, uh, it's not, uh, they're, they're not always looking into district heating. This will greatly depend on the national context. It will depend on how district heating is viewed nationally. For instance, in Croatia, uh, it is still viewed through the prism of uh, our old, let's say, regime. So it, it, it's still viewed as, as, as an uh, antique, as, as, a, as an old technology. So district heating isn't viewed in such a positive light. And therefore, cities, especially cities that don't have district heating, very often don't immediately jump to district heating as a solution. Uh, this has slowly been changing. District heating is becoming, is now currently viewed as, as something more positive, especially with the gas crisis we're currently having. So things are changing, but still, uh, I would I would actually say that heat pumps are more so in the focus, uh, more especially more so than 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 district heating. So no, uh, they are really looking for a, a, a wide range of options. Uh, it's not all just district heating focused. Yes, Astrid? maybe I can just add. I think I I agree, and and I think. What is important to say is that the heating and cooling map, I would say, is is the first step in in you know it gives you some insight of what is possible, and then you start to to work with your transition roadmap and your neighborhood kind of approach or district oriented approach, and you start to look deeper into uh, is it still a good idea, and then then also um, 
based on local initiatives like like um, uh, presented by Dominique, it's I think if you have an initiative from the neighborhood, it might just change your your plan, but it gives you direction and gives you idea of what makes sense. And with that, it makes also sense to look at all the different options and compare it. And and also uh, as said, the fifth generation district heating in itself is is sort of a hybrid form where you need also heat pumps and and, and other alternatives. But in general, adding adding district heating in in the system, it, it allows you to have more energy uh, sources to be used. Uh, this, because if you electrify everything, then, then the, the amount of pressure on that system is, is huge. And you still need solutions of, of uh, storage and conversion. So, so having, having a combination, especially in, in, in dense urban areas, makes sense. But I think it's, it, is, it is the, the, you need to look at a bit wider perspective and, and also take into account local uh, circumstances and, and social aspects. If I can complement on that, I think district heating is not a goal as such. It's um, I think the real challenge is how to become carbon neutral. I think uh, here there's uh, the biggest drive here is, well, the, I think the, the main driver um, will be probably the heat pumps plan, uh, having individual, solu individual solution um, where that is most possible or optimal, district heating can, can't run over a long uh, distance. Electricity is it's more easy to do. If you have, of course, existing district heating schemes, then the challenge is to make them carbon neutral. And then, of course, in, in specific contexts, it's uh, a district heating can be very interesting. Uh, for example, city centers where you have big density and uh, you don't want to have uh, a lot of uh, air-based uh, heat pumps or you can't drill into the ground for uh, for geothermal heat. So and you have a lot of old buildings you can't renovate uh, to a very large extent. So you have this specific context where district heating is becoming very interesting or you have a very interesting waste heat source. But it is always looking what is the best solution. And sometimes it will be the individual solution. Sometimes it will be the collective solution. Thank you. Um, unless any of the speaker wants to add one very last sentence, I think we should be done uh, and free up uh, all of you over here. Um, one last slide um, I wanted to share was just the websites of the three projects that were featured. Um, if you want from some more information, please feel free to uh, go visit them. Uh, and also, um, as uh, mentioned previously, there will be a, an email that uh, you should receive. Uh, please check your spams because it might be the case that, um, yeah, it might end up in the spams, unfortunately, uh, but with the recording and the, and the presentations that were shared. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, wishing you a very good day and see some of you most probably in Brussels next week or at the end of the month for um, more EU activities. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.